This is the President McCormack Podcast with your host, Mark McCormack. Ladies and gentlemen of the podcast, today, a very special guest of all time, Fadi Farid, for all your real estate needs. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for, for coming plug. on, bro. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. I'm excited. Oh, I love plugging businesses, man. Anything you're into. Hell yeah. So let's start off with one of the funny things that people know me for. So I talk mad shit about yeah. cold plunging, <laughs> <laughs> but you're the best cold plunger I've ever met. Yeah. Why is that? Well, because you've. Well, for number one, you live in freaking Michigan, right? <laughs> yeah. So when you're doing it in the winter, you walk out there in your big, big black tub, right? Yeah. And you got to take a sledgehammer and you're breaking at yeah. least an inch of ice, right? Yes. Yeah. Maybe even more. Maybe. I think I think a little bit more in the winter time. Yeah. Like sometimes I got to get the sledgehammer and get to work. Yeah. Well, it's just yeah. funny, man, because honestly, every time I watch you do it, I'm just like, oh, good for Fadi. Like he's freaking <laughs> doing it. Like it's crazy. Does it inspire you to do so? No, <laughs> no, nothing about it. <laughs> I'm funny with it, right? Cause like people, I mean, people hear me talk shit about it. I'll tease people, right? I'm like, oh, yeah. you're trying to get something done? Go do, go, go do a cold plunge first. Yeah. Maybe you'll figure it out. And um, I just find it kind of like, kind of one of the fads out there, right? Yes. You know? And so, but in all honesty, right? Which I always try to be honest about it. It does help people. It does. But yeah. what I want, what I want people to say to me, right? Cause I like to control everything, I guess. I just want people to say, Mark, I do it cause I like it. Yeah. There's no argument. Sure. Well, good. And yeah. then it, then it's a good thing for you. Right. Yeah. But what ends up happening is people go, hey, Mark, have you ever cold plunge? And I'm like, yeah, cold plunge. Well, I'm telling you, man, it makes your skin smoother. It makes you this, it makes your inflammation go down. Now they're going to this whole brown fat thing, which yeah. no one has. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, <laughs> why are you, why are you making this? So I have to argue with you. Right. Yeah. Just tell me you like to cold plunge and get you ready for the day. Uh, Boom. But, uh, so I'll ask uh, you, I, I, why do you cold plunge? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree. So there's a lot of things that um, I, I'm the type of person that I will try it and see how I feel. So I'm not, I couldn't tell you like a lot on the science. I mean, I, I know a little bit, whatever they tell me, but I mean, I don't know how true that is. So I experiment, experimented with it and then I felt the benefits. Like I feel gr great. And today I did two cold plunges, which is great. Cause nice. like everybody's like, Hey, you want a cold plunge? I was like, let's go. Uh, but like the number one, like physically, you're going to feel it, right? So you're going to go there in the cold, you're going to control your breath and you're going to feel it. And then when you get out, you're going to feel great. So once I did it a couple of times, I'm like, okay, I don't care if this is placebo or not. It's, yeah. it's, it's giving me good energy is is given is putting me in good mood. And then uh, I start making ritual out of it. So one of the rituals go there and break the ice. It's just part of the ritual, right? So I yeah. go there, break the ice, and now I have a sauna that has uh, wood burning, uh, like a wood burning wood. So like I would go there and chop the wood, which I don't, know, I, re I really don't need to chop the wood because I got a lot of wood. But it's yeah. a, it's a ritual. So I go chop the wood, feed it to the sauna, and the sauna will warm up and heats up the place. And then I go do the plunge, sauna, plunge, sauna, and I just I feel amazing after. So yeah. uh, sometimes I wonder. I'm like, this is so cold. Like I don't know how I'm not getting a heart attack right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. it's so cold, especially when it's cold outside, right? Uh, so I hope it doesn't have any negative effects, but for now I'm enjoying the, the benefits of it. Yeah, I don't think it's got any negative effects, right? I mean, you're just kind of cold. Uh, yeah, I, I, think I mean, I guess you could freeze a little bit, right? You can freeze if if yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, if you stay for a long time, then you might have some, I guess, reverse effects on it. You might go to hypothermia. Yeah. Uh, which, but I'm, I'm like the type of person that I want to do the minimal and get the most effects. So I'm not gonna max it out. Like I'll go in three minutes. I'm up, you know, yeah. three minutes, four minutes. I might push it here and there, but I want to get my three minutes and I'm out, you know, so I yeah. can get the benefits. And they say, when they say, and mostly it's basically coming from Wim Hof and, a and Andrew Huberman, right? They're kind of yeah. the two experts yeah. on this world. Correct. They're both basically like three minutes is enough, right? Like, like 11 minutes a week kind 11 of 11 minutes a week. Yeah. That's yeah. the science. So, I mean, if you do three minutes and I, I'll push a little bit more than 11 minutes a week just to, just to make sure I, I get the benefits. Yeah. But again, sometimes I just do it just cause I need uh, to wake up, you know? Yeah. So, I might go up more than 11 and sometimes I go two weeks without it, but, yeah. uh, but it works for me. So it's all good. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that is the answer, right? <laughs> yeah. Like it yeah. works for me. It makes my life better. I feel better when I do it. I, you know, and I love that. And there's a couple guys in our, well, there's more lot. than a couple, yeah, actually a lot, lot of the guys in our yeah. group. And it's kind of funny, you know, this is, this is my third podcast today. Right. So yeah. I've kind of been talking, telling stories and different things. And earlier we were talking 
And um, I do this thing, and I hope it always comes across well, but I like to tease guys in our group, yeah. right? Because I think it endures me to them a little bit, right? And then they can tease me a little bit, and then we're just kind of laughing, and we're kind of like just blowing it up, right? Yeah. Like, if you ever listened to, like, Matt Bray and me, or, you, dude, honestly, almost anybody, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I just, we tease, they tease, I tease, blah, 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 you know? If something stupid happens, I'm like, oh, shit, come help me, you know? But, and it's just like this... I don't know. It's like this brotherhood that we all have, right? You sure. know, like we joke around about your name up in Iceland, right? Because <laughs> people were here. And we'll even Dakota earlier. <laughs> yeah. You know, we'll see if he edits this this one. Yeah. But uh, you know, he, your name is Fadi. It's F A D Y. F A D Y. Right. Yeah. And you people all the time call you Fatty, right? Fatty, yeah. They're, and they're or Fatty. Yeah, Fatty. fatty. Yeah. 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 They're like adding e's to it or yeah. a t every now and again, you know. And they just like can't get around it, right? And so the reason, one of the ways I remember it is that stupid Lizzo song, whoever, right? It goes like, fadi yadi 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 Yes. And Nick is the one that said it first, right? And I was yeah. like, oh yeah, that, now I will never, ever forget his name. However, so every time I see you, that song goes through my head. So it's like, <laughs> it's, hilarious. it's kind of a two-edged sword. It, yeah, and and uh, that's a great, so I start using that to tell people my name. Because uh, apparently here in Utah, it's like, especially if I go like Starbucks somewhere, and it's like, the, I can see, their faces before they pronounce my name. They're like, <laughs> fatty. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> it's fatty. But yeah. I, I always tell them it's like body, but fatty. And I go, fatty, yaddy, 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 yaddy. There you yaddy. go. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, and it's, a, it's a good conversation starter, right? Yeah. And then they go, oh, fatty, what, what, is, what, is, what, is, what is that from? And what does it mean? And then we go, it's a great conversation starter, yeah. which is great because when I first moved to the States, uh, they wanted to change my name to like Freddie or Frank. So I, uh, I, 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 cause they're like, Fadi is like, it's a tough name. So, and, and you get an opportunity when you become citizen to change your name. And I'm so glad I didn't cause I really liked my name and, but I, I wanted to fit in. Yeah. So I thought about it. I worked at a hotel for a little bit and my name was Frank. Which is ironic because my, <laughs> my younger brother's actual name is Frank. So now oh, okay. got to Frank's. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad I, I, I stuck to it, you know. Oh, I, so absolutely. Yeah, I yeah, like yeah. my name. And the funny thing, too, is it's not that hard to get, right? It's not. You got to correct it. So it's kind of like me, right? Everyone says McCormick. Yes. Right? Just automatically. Yeah. And, and I, listen, I have a lot of leeway on that, right? Because there's McCormick Spices, there's McCormick and Schick's restaurant. Like they've seen that word many times throughout their life right correct however it's mccormack mccormack you know? yeah, yeah and so and i'll tell you i've told this story before but i'll tell you because it's kind of funny but um one time i was in a, i was given a speech in a, in, a, in a mormon church right back when i was a mormon and i stood up in front of me and said hey everyone i want to let you know my name is mark mccormack my wife michelle mccormack's down there i said here's the deal with me people you're gonna you're gonna be tempted to say my name mccormack and i'm never gonna correct you I'm just going to secretly think you're stupid, right? <laughs> <laughs> and not one person in that ward ever got my name yes. wrong, ever. In fact, people would be like, hey, Mark McCormack. <laughs> and I'm like, there you go. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I think I said it at the wad yes, one time exactly. too, right? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. why I started saying it correctly. Yeah, 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 exactly, right? And it's just like, but that's kind of one of those funny yeah. things. I like that about people, right? I like it when you're like, no, my name's Fadi. Yeah. And people are like, oh, yeah, cool. You know, and they kind of. Because no one wants to say someone's name wrong, right? right but then yeah. it's like, but yeah, but it's also not that big a deal, bro. You know, let's yeah. keep it rolling. And, and once you let it slide, and then becomes it, and and, and yeah. becomes like that becomes your name, and and yeah, so it's be best to correct it right there and then, and maybe give them something to relate it with. Because yeah. it's a it's a tough name, so yeah. I'm, I'm not too but but hurt about it, you know. So tell me, so so tell me where where, where it's from. What does it mean? Yeah, I actually don't know that. Oh, so Fadi. And so the, the actual translation of Fadi in Arabic means the sacrificer. So Fadi, the sacrificer, is referring to Jesus. So Fadi technically is Jesus, but it's not actually Jesus, but it's referring to sacrificer, which they're referring to Jesus because he sacrificed himself for us. So, oh, cool. Yeah, it's a, cool. it's a heavy name. Yeah. Yeah. And then f so for the people here that hear his name and hear a little bit of an accent, so yeah. where were you born? Yeah, so I was born in Iraq. I was uh, born and raised in Iraq, and I lived there... I lived in Baghdad for 13 years. Then I moved to the States. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us what it's like living in Baghdad. So like, honestly, I think for most Americans, at least my age, they're in their forties, right? So we have a song. Have you heard the song out from outcast called bombs over Baghdad? Yes. Yeah, okay. So yeah. that, that was the first time I think I yeah. ever actually heard that word. Correct. Right? Yeah. I might've heard it when I was in the knowledge bowl for geography. Right. But really we don't teach middle Eastern 
uh, history here at all. Yeah. Right? It's, you know, we barely get through American history yeah. before we got to start yeah. changing it and fixing it and whatever. Right. And so, but the next time I heard about Baghdad, it's obviously when we went into the Iraqi war. True. And, um, and I, I think I've told you this, but to, to remind you, I actually had a guy from Iraq, um, named Ali that used to work for him in the shop when I was a teenager. Right. Yeah. And I can't remember the circumstances. Oh no, I know why he came over here. This is, this is kind of wild. They were prepping for war. And so they would bring over Iraqi people and give them citizenship to go sit on military bases and act like they're in a normal city so that our soldiers could see uh, yes. what, you know, a threat looked like and a non-threat. So they got used to seeing people with that, you know, that ethnicity or, you know, whatever it worked. And so, so he would go and he would like leave every, every year for like four weeks and go wow. and do this training. And then he'd come back. He was a welder. So he'd come back and work in our shop and weld the rest of the time. And, um, so I got a little bit of experience into Iraq, but I think for the general public, right? Like we know the war in Iraq, we know Saddam Hussein with bad, bad man who had, who ended up not having weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. And I think it's really, really basic what people understand about Iraq. So feel free just to, I mean, tell us what it's like to grow up there. Like, cause I know you actually enjoyed it. Yeah. So yeah. I, I mean, I, I grew up in, in Baghdad. Uh, that's why I had my childhood. And a lot of people think when, when they, when they ask, ask me, it's so funny. They say, is it like desert in there? So I used to joke a lot and, and, and I used to like in high school and tell them, yeah, it's desert. And we ride our camels to school. <laughs> and they used Dude, to if I'm being honest, <laughs> I thought it was desert until right now. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't blame them because like when the war happened, the only images you start seeing, like they're Iraq for the U S didn't exist. And then the war happened. All you see is the, like, you know, the desert videos where they're taking the tanks and everything, but actually it was city and they had like paved roads and, and everything. And, um, uh, it was a normal city. We had school, school system. As uh, uh, I mean, and we we're talking twenty years ago, so yeah. things weren't as advanced everywhere twenty years ago. Yeah. Uh, Iraq's completely different now, uh, but it was just like normal. I mean, we we're, we're regular day would look like we're. I'll get up. It was a little bit different, so I would get up. I'll walk to school, which was re re really cool. Uh, I would walk maybe maybe a mile, two miles. I don't recall. Uh, and then we'll walk back until like later on where we got a bus. It's not, it's not a public bus. So it's a private bus. Yeah. And then you go to school, come back and it's hot as shit there. So we'll <laughs> wait for the temperature to cool down and we'll go outside and play soccer. Yeah. Uh, just in the streets, you know, somebody will take, we'll usually take our shoes off, we make it a goal and two goals in the streets and we'll play barefoot, uh, which was great for your feet, you know, and then, and then we go home and the privileged kids usually have like a, sega or playstation i'll go somebody's house and play that and uh yeah that was that was about it and then we'll eat dinner really really late yeah uh, we actually we have four meals we'll have breakfast lunch uh and then between lunch and dinner there's a meal uh and then we have dinner really late and that's it what time's really late uh 9 9 30. okay so it's kind of like spain it's like yeah it's like spain see yeah. spain was blowing my mind we're eating dinner at like 10 o'clock at night <laughs> yeah. and i'm like yeah when the hell do you people sleep you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's always it's, it's a weird diet where we yeah. ha we have it too. Like nine thirty, we'll eat like burgers and stuff at night yeah. <laughs> before we go to bed, um, and then we'll be up for school again. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So, if you were to compare Baghdad to a city in the United States, is there one that's similar? Mm, so, yeah, it's it's tough to compare it to a city. Uh, I would say. I was going to say Vegas with the weather. I would say more Arizona, maybe. I okay. don't know. It's, it's tough to compare it. Kind of like Phoenix? Yeah, kind of like Phoenix. Okay. Uh, so big, like big city center skyscrapers yeah. and stuff, then kind of like suburb on the outside? Co correct. So, yeah. yeah. So the, at least that's how I remember it. Again, like now it's different. It's completely different. Yeah. But the way I, it was, Baghdad was the city, which was the top of everything else. And then we used to go to the villages. And the villages was a village like so so i'm actually chaldean so i am actually from a village in iraq which depends who you debate that's where like technically where babylon was or babylonians but we can't say that because people get pissed and there's <laughs> argument about it but at least that's that's what i think it, it, the location was like so so we're chaldeans we speak chaldeans we speak chaldean which is close to aramaic uh which the, G, the language jesus spoke and we're catholic majority are catholic uh, and so that area was like a village. So there's place we used to go to, uh, in the summertime to visit family there. Their houses was built of like mud, kind of. 
And then their toilet system was like hole in the ground and you just go squat and, and, and pop squat there and, yeah. and, and poop. And then when you, uh, when you shower, the water will come out like the wall. And then there is like, uh, there's, no, there, there's no sewer system, it was exposed sewer system. So if somebody's showering, you can see the shampoo with the water coming out of there and, and then just feeding to the, like a little hole in the ground outside and then takes it, I don't know where it takes it. So that was in the village. <laughs> yeah. So when we go to like those places, we're like show off because we're the city boys, you know, we're like, yeah. ooh, like, I don't know, like New Yorker going to hang out with the Amish or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. So, so yeah, that's, uh, it, so Baghdad was like the city where every, everything was advanced technically compared well, to- Well, and your city. family was pretty affluent, right? Uh, and, and what do you mean? Like, I mean, they were, uh, they were wealthy. They had uh, uh, businesses and jobs. And, yes, yeah, I wouldn't you know. say like wealthy. Uh, I mean, we were start getting wealthy. Um, and we, we were doing good financially. So I wouldn't say yeah. like top wealthy. Well, you, you'd be like uh, upper middle class. Yeah, upper middle, yeah, yeah. upper middle. Uh, yeah, so my, my dad was in the alcohol business. Uh, at least he got, he had a, a hotel north of Iraq and he's in, he was in the alcohol business. He, he used to process uh, Uzo, which is Arak. Uh, I gotta get you some, I think you would yeah. love it. Yeah. Uh, and then we got some flavors from the United States and then we got flavor Uzo, which was great. Uh, and was legal at that time until uh, you know the war happened and then they stopped you can't you couldn't produce it anymore so yeah. we were like we were getting we're getting there uh, i think financially yeah yeah and did you guys did you live through the war there no. earlier no so so what happened is really interesting so what happened is so we always knew we were going to move to the united states we always knew we we didn't own the house. We always rented, and we always lived in a way that hey, kids, we're gonna go to the states soon. But there was no urgency behind it. Our like my mom and dad's side all lived in the states, so <clears throat> we knew at some point we we're gonna move to the state. But there was no urgency behind it because we're doing okay. And then uh, in Iraq, there's four channels. All four channels are regulated by the government. You're not allowed to have dish network, satellites. Even the internet was monitored. So all the media was controlled. <clears throat> so we get intelligence from the states, like, not intelligence, but like our family here talk to us in codes and say, hey, like, you know, there's a war, it's going to happen soon. So you guys, you know, you need to, you need to get out. Because again, we're Catholic in Iraq, minorities. Uh, so... So we thought that was a good time to actually get serious about leaving. So, we, so we left. Uh, we left to Jordan, which is like a neighboring country, and we started expediting the paperwork process. And then, while we were in Jordan, two months later, the 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 war happened. Uh, and then, and then, I think we stayed in Jordan for six months before our paperwork got in there, and then we just moved out. Yeah. Yeah. When the war started in Baghdad, did they level the city? Like, did it destroy the city? Uh, they didn't destroy the city, but what happened was, um, everything, the, the, not the military, but like the police system went down because like, uh, they took over the, like the country. So it was, it was happening that we saw that the Saddam Hussein statue went down and that's it. I mean, they took over. That's it. Everybody like yeah. surrendered. So at that time there, the peace not the peace, but like the safety start getting really scary because at that point, whoever has the biggest family with the most amount of siblings control the street. So in the neighborhood I lived in, uh, maybe a few blocks down there, there was a small Air Force base. <clears throat> and my friend lived in that, in that subdivision, which is crazy how they set up Air Force right next to residentials. But... <laughs> uh, but anyways, he said when, when he, he lived through it and he said when, when the war happened and said everybody left the base. So he went in there and he said we took uh, bullets, grenades, AK-47. He's like, pull up your, it's like we took beds, we took everything out of there. And now he was one guy. And he said the other neighboring, if you have six, seven guys in the family, everybody went load up on AK-47s, bombs, uh, you know, everything you want. And then... And then you're powerful, and then you can go in. If you have beef with someone, you can just go run them over. So the peace got got really dist disrupted. So every man had to guard their house pretty much until things settled a little bit. How long did that take from the settle? Uh, I, I think it took almost a year for them just to kind of like 
I think the people to get together and say, like, like let's chill and not kill each other. Yeah. <clears throat> now, one thing, so we went to dinner last night, right? We were kind of talking about this, um, which I find wildly interesting, right? Mostly because I feel like in America, we're fed shit on the news, right? We're just lied to, right? I shouldn't say we're fed. We're just straight up lied to. Yeah. And so everyone in the U.S., thought that Saddam Hussein was like this evil, nasty dictator. Like you guys are walking in the streets and getting whipped. You know what I mean? Like yeah. just, they paint this picture of like the most evil guy in the world. So tell us, what was it like living in a country that Saddam Hussein was a leader in? Yeah. And I can only share my experience. Yeah. Uh, some people had different experiences. My experience was he was good. Uh, as long as you don't go against him, uh, yeah. you know, don't talk shit about kind it. Kind of like our country. No, that's not like You can <laughs> nah. talk shit about your president. <laughs> well, that's uh, true. That's true. That's true. Uh, yeah. And, and I'll tell you a story about that. But <clears throat> I think like he never hurt us. At least at, at least as Catholics and Christians in Iraq, we were protected. Uh, rumor said when, when, when they invaded the country, he actually stayed with a uh, priest, uh, I think, and I don't know how true that information is, but he stayed, he chose to stay with the priest. He just had a huge trust for them, and we were protected. Now, I, and I say it was good when he was ruling the country versus him not ruling the country, because look what happened when he left. ISIS took over, and then they went and marked the letter N, which like stands for Nasarene, which means the Christians, on every, on every door, and every door had that letter N. People in there got beheaded. Right, uh, or people had to flee their houses, yeah. and and this is happening today. Is like like this is almost unheard of. It's barbaric, right? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> that you get beheaded because of your religion. Uh, so like so personally, I think when he was there, I think it was better than him not being there. Yeah. And I think sometimes you got to lead a country with force. Uh, yeah. And he was feared man. He was very very feared, and he had his persona. People were afraid of him. So. But it served them well uh, at that time, and then the country went to shit. But it looks like it looks like it's getting better now, at least from what I see on social and things like that. It looks like their their infrastructure is getting back. People are build, building places. So oh, good. Yeah, it's getting who's better. the? Do you know who the leader currently is? I don't. Yeah, no. I was gonna say I don't either. <coughs> yeah, I it's don't. kind of one of those funny things, right? It's like you know Gaddafi, right? Is yeah. it Libya? Was he in Libya? Yeah, Libya. Yeah. You know, they killed that mother trucker, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, I don't even know who the new guy is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we never hear that. All we hear is, super evil guy, blah, 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 blah. And the next thing you know, it's on to the next thing, right? Sure. And it's kind of like, you know, I mean, we're writing history, right, as we as we live it. And it's like, you know, I kind of look back at history, and I'm like, this is interesting. I wonder who was, it's, al it's always the victor who writes the history, True. right? Yeah. It's like, I wonder what really happened throughout the years, you know? Because yeah. the Middle East, to me, as far as I can tell, is it best mismanaged, Right? There's countries that really don't get along with each other, crazy fighting. Then you have countries like the US or the like Russia and the US yeah. that come in and back everybody financially and militaristically. And it's just like, it's just it's a cluster, right? And it's almost like, well, how would these countries behave if we just got the hell out of them, right? Let them govern themselves. You probably have a, a good firsthand knowledge of that, right? I mean, yeah. is the Middle East safe if each country is on their own? Uh, yeah, it was very safe. I yeah. mean, I mean, when we were there, it was very safe, <clears throat> and that's that's the thing. It's I think Saddam was so ruthless that if you get caught stealing, uh, you you know you might get beheaded. I uh, there was I don't know how true that is, but there's few people if you look on YouTube that they cut their ear or cut a finger if they stole something. Uh, not everybody got the same treatment, obviously, but. It, so when you hear someone stole something and his arm got cut off, you're kind of like, fuck, maybe I should think twice about stealing. Right. <laughs> uh, so, or, yeah, so it, it was, he had to enforce those kind of rules because it just control the type of people. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was safe. Uh, I mean, yeah, we didn't, we didn't, I, we had, I have one experience where they stole like my mom's car uh, and then they found it within like 24 to 48 hours. Uh, but other than that, I think, was safe. It was safe in sense. There'll be there'll always be stealing. There's always be shooting, right? <clears throat> but what happened after it? I got friends that got kidnapped after the war, and that was something happening a lot. You have a lot of money, you get kidnapped. Well, that didn't exist during during Saddam's time, time yeah. right? Everybody wouldn't do that, or or they wouldn't go 
shoot somebody's house down because you got beef with them. That it just didn't happen, you know? So there was that type of security there and that was gone after he left. And I think it's 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 safe now. I think yeah. but if you if you leave them on their own, I think they'll figure out they'll they'll guard it. Yeah. Uh, they'll they guard their house. Um, yeah. So if we um, we kind of talked up Tash just a quick little bit, but freedom of speech over there. How would you describe that versus, I mean, America, obviously Shit. we can say whatever the hell we want, but like, um, what was it like over there? It was, it, it, there was, yeah, I wouldn't say there was freedom of speech. Uh, I mean, if you, man, I remember one time my friend, my friend and I sit in the backyard and my, and, and there every, every, uh, every subject book, you open it, the first page has a picture of Saddam there. And him and I were sitting on a chair outside in the yard, and he has the book under his, his feet, and he steps on it, which is disrespect. He picked Saddam's picture in there. And I'm looking left and right like, oh, fuck, what if somebody sees us, you know? <laughs> like, we're, we're, we're afraid. Uh, so if you think you're going to go outside and talk shit and, and not something's going to happen, yeah, I think you're delusional. So there wasn't no freedom of speech. If your neighbor or your parents saw you step on a book like that, would they come and say something to you? Or would, they, would they tattle on you? Or no, was it more... It, no, so 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 really cool thing, cool out culture about Iraq and Middle East in general. <clears throat> your neighbors to the 10th door. So 10 doors to the left, 10 doors to the right, are your extended family. They say... They say your neighbor, your neighbor, your neighbor, your neighbor. So those are your family. They become your extended family. So they usually look out for you. So if you do something like that, they're not going to rat, rat on you or like go yeah. say something. But we were always like careful. Like, yeah. why would you even go down that path? Like, you know, it, it's, it's a scary road. It's just a matter of somebody that knows somebody that can get you in trouble. So when we were living there, we always had the mindset, we're temporary living here. So mind your business. You know, stay away from politics as much as you can, and uh, and you should be fine. So, yeah. But freedom of speech, that didn't exist. Yeah. So, so I'll tell you a story, man. Um, so, I'll tell you about the school system. So, our, our, our school in Iraq, the school system was, you stay in the class, and the teacher will come to your class, right? And teachers there were feared and respected, so you stay in your class, it's a big class, and there's a big blackboard, and top of each blackboard there's a picture of Saddam Hussein. And when the teacher walks into the class, everybody shuts up, stands up, and say, Long live our leader, Saddam Hussein. <laughs> <laughs> and the teacher will say, sit down, and will say, thank you, teacher. Next class, teacher walks in, long live our leader, Saddam Hussein, sit down, thank you, teacher, and you respect and fear the teacher, because the teacher can beat your ass they wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> so I moved to the States. First day in class. They show me where my classroom is. I don't speak English. I'm 14 years old, freshman. They show me, uh, they show me the class, and I go. I walk into the class, and I'm nervous as shit because I don't speak English. I find a desk, and I sit on my desk. And I'm like, oh, cool. I get my own desk. That's pretty cool. And then I'm sitting down in anticipation for the teacher to walk in. The teacher walks in. I stand up. Because I thought we we're going to say, long live our leader, George Bush. <laughs> 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 then I get up and nobody's getting up. So I look around like, the fuck? Yeah. Maybe that's not the teacher. So I pretend like I'm stretching and I sit down. And the guy comes in and is like, my name is so-and-so. I'll be your math teacher today. So I get up again. <laughs> I get up again and I'm like, what the hell? Nobody's getting up. So I, then I pretend like I'm doing something in my backpack and I sit down. And then later I learned that. Uh, you don't do that here. Yeah, you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and you can talk shit about the president, you talk shit about the teacher, and nobody said thing. Yeah. But that was like one of the culture shocks I had here. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like nobody's standing up <laughs> and, and, and saying, long live our leader. Because yeah. back back home, the the motto was, uh, our country, and it was God, our country, the president. So that was yeah. our motto. So... <laughs> So that was one of, one of my culture shocks when I uh, when I was in school. There was a lot of culture shocks. I, actually, when when I moved to the states, it was it was a very difficult transition. Uh, I come from Middle East. Here I am in America, day and night. Right, fourteen years old. I don't speak the language. Uh, I spoke like ten words, uh, and then now I'm learning a new lang a new subject. So I'm learning biology, math, yeah. in, in, in English. 
And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a teenager, so I'm trying to fit in. You can't fit in because you don't speak the language. So it was, a, it was a tough culture shock in the beginning. And, and just it took maybe three years until I got to a point where like, all right, I can kind of have a conversation now. And I kind of have an understanding of what the culture looks like here. Because I, I doesn't matter how much like movies I watched and uh, uh, music videos I watched didn't prepare me to uh, firsthand to see what it looks like, you know? Yeah. yeah. Were you excited when you came over to the States? Hell yeah. Yeah. What was the most exciting thing you're looking forward <clears throat> to? So, so we always knew we we're going to move to the States. I would literally have a dream that I'm in America. Like I will have a dream and I always imagine America to have like the, the roads to have tile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go to Michigan, there's fucking potholes. <laughs> uh, I can cuss on this, right? Oh yeah. You can say whatever uh, you want. So, I always imagine there'll be lights like like Vegas style and there's like uh tile floors um green everywhere. Uh that's what I what I thought it's going to be like. So I was I was very excited actually to move uh actually on the flight here to the states. Uh, I fell asleep in a plane and then in my dream I dreamed that I was dreaming that I was going to the state. I'm like fuck. <laughs> and then I woke up I'm like I'm not sleeping in this flight until we get to, <laughs> to yeah. America. Uh, but I think, uh, the most exciting thing, uh, so America everywhere, you have the American dream and it's sold very well. And it, because it, it's true, I don't know if the American dream still exists now. It's maybe it's a little bit different. Uh, but at least back in the day, everybody had the American dream. You yeah. go to America and you do what the hell you want to do. You become what the hell you want to become. In Iraq and in the Middle East at that time, again, 20 years ago, there was like the internet wasn't there. You didn't have much exposure. Good luck. You yeah. know, good luck. If you don't have the connection, good luck making it. Yeah. So, so I had the American dream. Uh, and my American dream then is different from here because back in the days, my American dream was I wanted a front beach mansion. Mansion on the beach. I wanted a red two-seater Corvette, Had to be a red two-seater Corvette. And I wanted two blondes that sits in my red two-seater Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that was that was my American dream. That was like, nice. man, so if I can get the mansion, the car, the girls, that'd be sweet. <laughs> well, things change now. I like lakes and I don't like Corvettes and I prefer brunettes over blondes. So <laughs> <laughs> my American dream has changed. Yeah. But I think the American dream that was sold, at least to us, is like you go there, you do whatever you want to do. Because I remember like in Iraq, we'll, we'll watch things, we'll have ideas. And we always thought that's not for us. Like, yeah. okay, this is cool. <clears throat> like you'll see a movie and you see them doing things. You see the, the, the people that start from zero and they become like something big. And I always thought, oh, well, that's not for us. That's, you can't do that here. You do that in America. So when I moved and I got the opportunity, I just... I don't know. I had that fire in my belly to like, all right, let's let's do it. Let's do the American dream. Tell me what I need to do, and I'll do it. Yeah, which was a blessing and a curse at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Hey, over in Iraq, did you guys get a lot of American um, American media? Like, like what movies were you guys able to see? Did they censor some of them and not others? Yeah, so they censored all the kissing parts, son of a bitches. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> any sexual stuff, they'll censor it. Yeah, uh, they'll cut it. So we're not exposed to a lot of sexual things. Schools were separated, guys and girls. Um, and uh, they'll show us movies. So the media will run, I think, from 6 in the morning uh, until like 12 at night. They'll play a movie for you. They call it like the last movie of the day or whatever. And then it goes for two hours. <clears throat> but I'm sure the movies were, were, I mean, at that time, what was popular was Jackie Chan, Van Damme, Rambo's movies. Uh, so we'll watch that comedy uh, but I don't know how much they put, how much of a thoughts they put into it. Yeah. So again, they controlled it. So we didn't have, uh, access to watch whatever movie we want to watch. Right. I mean, there were some places where you go buy a CD and you can watch, like watch a movie different than what, what, what they were showing you, but then you run, um, the movies they show us, at least they're translated. So they know what they're saying. But if you go buy the CD, uh, it's not translated, so you just kind of have to figure oh, it it's out. it's all in English. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they didn't show us uh, a lot of uh, American media. Uh, and, and they tried, I think, as kids, not I think, I know they tried to install in us that America was was evil. 
<clears throat> so we always like had the poems written about America, how evil, evil country, evil country, evil country. They try to install that in us uh, since uh, early age. But we knew we were coming to America, so we were biased. So we were like, all right. Yeah, well, well, we, they say hell to America. And I'm like, I'm not saying that. I'm going there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it was very, very, it's very they, they fed certain type of information for sure. Yeah. They control the media for yeah. sure. Now, you, uh, you mentioned this earlier, and it's very fascinating to me. You grew up Catholic. Yeah. Um, in a very predominantly Muslim country, right? Yeah. When you were growing up, did that cause issues with your neighbors or did the people keep the peace? Uh, no, they kept the peace. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did our part, they did our part. Were your neighborhoods mixed? Uh, yeah, I mean, our neighborhood was 80-20. I, I didn't live, there were some areas where majority were like Christians and Catholics, but my neighborhood was very mixed. My both neighbors were Muslim, across the street were Muslim. Uh, yeah, there was, I would say 80-20. Yeah. Was religion openly spoke about, or was it kind of like you keep it to yourself and just enjoy your life? Try, try to keep it to yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah, try to keep it to yourself. You don't want to go down that path, because right? it's, yeah. it's loose. Just cause arguments, right? Because cause, Muslims and Catholics are historically pretty at and, each other's throats. And fights. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they stay out of it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. So were your neighbors, did you guys visit them a lot? Did you, yeah. were you always, is it like America in that same way, where you're just kind of friendly with your neighbors? And I would say more. Uh, yeah, the neighbors, like I said, they're extended family. So you go there, have coffee, tea, <clears throat> lunches and dinners. They bring us dishes. We'll take them dishes. Yeah. Uh, we know what's going on in their life. They know what's going on in our lives. So we, we kind of kept to ourselves a lot. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was open communication between us too. So over there versus being in America, so you had a little five-year-old kid right now. Uh -huh. What would be the benefits of growing up in, in Baghdad versus the benefits of growing up in Michigan? Um, so obviously if you grow here, you, so it's, a, it's it, there's two, two ends to the story. So if you grow, grow here, uh, you're obviously have more exposure to technology. I have more exposure to open mind thinking. Uh, you kind of have semi freedom of thinking, I would say, or freedom of thinking. Well, the issue with that, you don't know what it looks like on the other side. So you kind of take it, take it for granted, right? Yeah. So you don't know what it's actually looks like in other countries. You, I think people that are born here and don't leave the country, they think that's how it is everywhere else, which is not true. So, so for example, when we lose power in Michigan, it's happened three times this year, you should see everybody freaks the fuck out. Like, oh my God, the world's ending, bitching, complaining. Where in Iraq, you get like five, six hours of power. You lose power like every day. Um, and that's normal. Uh, but here, when something like this happens, it's a big deal. Yeah. And that's that's one thing we were, ta we were talking about yesterday is I, I think it's been good times uh, in, in the U.S. right now. And good times create weak people. So if you don't take the opportunity like if i had kids i would take them to a third world country country and expose them to the culture and show them what it looks like so they have that that hunger don't, don't take them to cancun all inclusive you know <laughs> resorts <laughs> yeah, but yeah. take them take them somewhere where it's a third world country show them what the kids lives looks like show them that the kids actually have to work walk to school and sit down and the schools don't have acs and you get three people per desk uh, on on each desk and the teacher comes in and can beat you up because you didn't do your homework and um and then if you want to pay simple things it is like mailing system uh, here you know i can order something on amazon and get it next day I you try to say send something there right now, it takes maybe a month for them to get it. And it's, it's very difficult. You're not yeah. going to get them. You don't have your own mailing system. So the comfort level here is very, very high. Yeah. Uh, which, which is great. I mean, I guess you get a, grow up with no traumas maybe. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, if you don't do something to get you out of that comfort zone, you might just become snowflake. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So over in Iraq, did you have very many American companies that were visible, like McDonald's or? At that time, no. None, right? No. So like, well, did you have an Apple store or anything like that? No, no. So yeah, no. At that time, no. Now there is. Now there is. Uh, uh, my parents are there right now visiting, and the 
they just send me pictures of videos of the malls and they have all that at that time no now remember before the uh the 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 last war there was another war when when iraq in, invaded kuwait and i think what happened is uh america built kuwait out and then what they did is and i can't think of the word where like all the countries will ally together to not like cut all the import export from iraq so the on embargo yeah so that so at that time <clears throat> when the import export stopped then everything has to be manufactured whatever within like within the country so we had very very limited um access to anything american like i remember like kit kat was like i would show up show off eating kit kat yeah um and uh, i remember like Pepsi cans are, were very expensive versus the bottles. We had the bottles because they were just to refill those. But a can, dude, I used to have a can and I'll like drink my Pepsi and I'll leave, I'll save the can and I'll fill it up with water and just walk around. <laughs> drink it like, hey, yeah, yeah. hey, I'm still drinking Pepsi can, baby. Yeah. Uh, there was, there was, uh, we used to hang out at a plaza that had uh, like, I would say like a small grocery store. It's not as in grocery, but like we'll sell like chips, snacks, drinks. Yeah. And that plaza was right across from the, the all girls school. So they were talking to girls was very, very hard. Like boyfriend, girlfriend doesn't exist really. It's like you either get married or you don't. You know, it's right. no boyfriend, boyfriend. It's very strict culture. So, what we so is do, there like no premarital sex? Hell no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no. Your uh, woman's supposed to say, say virginity to marriage. Uh, but man can have sex all they want, unlimited. Uh, so this is just kind of, and that was like culture, part culture, part, part religion. So it's yeah. not like, um, yeah. So anyway, so we used to go, so we used to jump the fence from the school, uh, guys. Okay. And I'm talking about 12 years old. So we used to jump the fence. Which, man, if they catch you, holy shit, they'll beat the fuck out of you. <laughs> <laughs> so he's to jump the fence and then go in front of that uh, old girl's school. And I'll go buy a, a Pepsi can and have a Kit Kat and just trying to show my status here, right? I'm yeah. like, hell yeah, I'm a baller, man. I just dropped a couple of grand on this. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to stand there and just like kind of flirt with the girls. He flirt in a very passive way that if you would have caught, like, hey, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking... Uh, how beautiful the sun is, the sun is shining and some shit like yeah. that. And then you write your number on a piece of paper and you drop it there. It's a very complicated process. You drop your number and she might pick it up, she might not pick it up. And now if she picks it up, she has to call you. She has to call you and you have a home phone. <laughs> yeah. So now you gotta, you don't know when she's gonna call. So you, you're waiting there by the phone. Maybe she calls, maybe she not. And if she called, you have to be the one who answered and you gotta talk for two minutes. And that's our love, our love world. Yeah. Fast forward, I come to America. And you can just have conversations with anyone. It was just like normal. I'm like, wow, this is heaven. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we get to have conversation. I didn't. So the first, when I first, I first moved to San Diego, then I moved to Michigan. And then uh, my cousins took me out to the beach and, and I saw like, oh, there's so many girls and I want to talk to them, but I don't speak English. So I put a plan in place. So my friend gave me those pe the pencils, the small pencils you take when you go golfing. So you write your score oh, yeah. and a piece of paper because I didn't have a cell phone. And he said, all you got to do is say, hi, what's your name? And she'll tell her your name. Tell her my, my name is Fadi. And then what's your phone number? And you tell her you're beautiful. And what's your phone number? So I'm going down to the beach here in San Diego. And I'm just going out to girls like, hi, hi, what's your name? And she tells me, like, my name is Fadi. You're beautiful. What's your phone number? She's like, oh, you want my phone number? Like. Yeah, so she started giving me a phone number, and I pull out a piece of paper and a pencil. I'm like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> Just writing it down all. Ooh. And 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 yeah, and then and it took a lot of no's to finally I got one yes, and then we went home, and I got my cousin that can translate, and we called that phone number, and and it said the person who gave you that phone number probably didn't want to give you that phone number. Remember that shit when they give you like a yeah. phone, wrong phone number to something else? Like, oh man, and yeah. <laughs> So it was a long time of rejection before I, I got the yeah. language down and got things down. So how hard was it to learn English? Uh, I don't think it was very hard. It just took time. Yeah. Uh, it just took time to kind of understand like the structure of the words, uh, how to put the words together, how to use like 
uh, like the grammar correctly and things like that. Yeah. Uh, spelling was hard. I mean, I, I can't spell till this day. Thank God for computers and phones. <laughs> well, we freaking have a million different things for a million different things. You know? Correct. It's like, well, so it was it was difficult, but it wasn't that hard. And it's the third language you learned. Correct. Right. Yeah. So the other two are Arabic, and what's the other one? Chaldean. Chaldean. Yeah. yeah. So at home we spoke Chaldean, and then when we went out to schools, we spoke Arabic, and then we learned English here. So how? Give us something in Arabic. <clears throat> uh, so I would say. Liam Gad Dasawi interview via Mark McCormack. And then in Chaldean it would be uh Idio and Tiwa amid Mark Uada podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's uh two different so I'm saying I'm sitting here with Mark doing podcasts in the yeah. two different languages. They're actually they're not close at all. They're very different, right? Yeah, they're very different. Yeah. yeah. Did you grow up learning both of them at the same time? Uh I, yeah, pretty much. My mom spoke mainly Chaldean, and my dad would speak Arabic to us. Uh, so then at home, they'll really try to speak like Chaldean, yeah. which is possible, because you, once you go to school, you start speaking Arabic. Yeah. Yeah. Were you, were you both your parents Catholic? Yeah. Okay. Did Were their parents Catholic? Was it kind of passed down through generations? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. And then, so now that you live in the States, are you still Catholic, or...? Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm Catholic. I, I mean, I don't practice. I don't like do the everything a Catholic has to do. Yeah, uh, but I'm, I'm yeah, Catholic. but if someone asks you, you're yeah, I'm yeah, Catholic. I'm a Catholic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Is it uh, is it tempting to drop religion being in America, or is that just part of you? To drop the religion? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think just part of me. Uh, yeah. That uh, <clears throat> that you know, I had a lot of questions. Uh, especially the way like our church was running things. Uh, some things I related with, some things I related with. Um, I like part of the culture, part, part I don't. So I just kind of uh, took my own path. In yeah. Way. Yeah. 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 I love that. Yeah. The reason I ask is it seems like here in the United States, like a lot of people are turning away from religion completely. Right. More and more every year. Yeah. And so I wonder if it's, uh, I mean, I think historically part of that's been a little, you know, people are, Kids grow up in a religion and they want to kind of not necessarily rebel against it, but they want to see what else the world has to offer. And then, you know, I think historically they kind of came back to the religion they grew up in. Right. True. And then a lot of people, you know, being in the Mormon culture here, we yeah. send missionaries out to convert people yeah. and change their religion. Right. So changing religion is a pretty common thing here in the United States or here in the culture in Utah, but mm. it's, it's still, but I think here in Utah, what's not common is people, leaving religion and becoming agnostic or atheist. And so, yeah. but when I look over the entire breadth of the country, it kind of seems like more people are moving to agnostic, right? They're just kind of rejecting the way they grew up and kind of what they would call progression. Right. You know, do you feel the same thing here? Or? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think, yeah, I think because you have the flexibility to do so, right? Uh, so, yeah. I, I mean, like in some places, at least like in Iraq, if you're not, Muslim or Christian, then, you know, if you're Muslim, at least you, maybe you go against Christians. If you're Christian, go against Muslim. But if you're none, then, then you get attacked by both, right? Yeah. So uh, I think as things progress, as there's more media, there's more like research, people have access to YouTube where they can explain things. Now you have not just one source of authority, but you have multiple sources of authority. So now you start looking at things differently like before if you had a question about where we go when we die then you had one answer now you can go like let's say on youtube and find out okay well, well what, what does you know what do the jewish say what other like religions say and then you kind of formulate you know your own, uh, own answer and yeah. then <clears throat> i think a lot of people might turn away from religion because there's so many rules and guidelines and then the more rules and guidelines kind of strict you from doing some things. Yeah. Some, so maybe that's why people take like the extreme and say, oh, no, I'm not going to follow any religion or any thoughts or yeah. anything like that. Did you know any atheists over in Iraq? No. Or an agnostics, agnostics, right? Like none of those? No. Any Jewish people? Uh, very few. Very few? Very few. Was there other um, different types of Christianity? Was it like Baptist or Methodist or anything like that? Uh, yeah, yeah, small, small percentage. Small, yeah, because it's pretty much mostly Muslim, then a decent sized Catholic, and then pretty much yeah, and there's 1%, like everything yeah, else. there's like some subs here and there, uh, but they're very small. Or at least they didn't talk about it. 
Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess. I guess. Yeah. You probably keep it to yourself. Yeah. Just keep it to yourself. Yeah. 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 They didn't talk about it. No. All right. Yeah. Cool. So now switching gears a little bit. So kind of bring you up to speed where you're at in your life. Yeah. So you are a realtor right now. Yes. Right? How'd you get into that? Uh, how I got in real estate. So I actually went to school uh, for nursing. Uh, so I went to school for nursing and I got my nursing degree and start working work in a nursing field. And I'm like, okay, this is not what I thought it's going to be. Uh, and I start having conflict with the way that our medicine system and medical system is run. <clears throat> and it's, is not what I thought it was going to be. And so I chose nursing to be, to have a bedside patient care. And I thought I was going to go there and yeah. uh, guide people through like maybe breath work, mindset, eating healthy. And then when I got in the field, we we're just pushing meds. Like a patient of mine will have anxiety and I'll sit down and start doing breath work. And then quickly nurses will come in like, what the fuck you're doing? It's yeah. Xanax, PRN as needed. Let's go. Give them ambient to sleep, Xanax for anxiety, the daffinol in the morning to wake them up, and so on and so forth. I'm like, huh. You know what's crazy is when you verbalize that and say it, yeah. everyone knows it's true, but you almost want to disbelieve it. Correct. Right? Because that's what the doctor prescribed you. Yeah. Or, but like that is the reality of the American health system, right? We're just going to yeah. prescribe you to death. Correct. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then there are side effects. So you're taking all the other meds for it. And it really bothered me. It didn't sit, sit well with me. Um, and then I, I think a lot of nurses shouldn't be nurses. Uh, it takes very, very special person to be a nurse. And I think some of them are in the wrong business because it pays well, pays okay. Um, yeah, so what happened is uh, I kind of, kind of started getting fed up with it. And I was working like long hours, 18 hour shifts, because I always worked. So like for me, they gave me 40 hours and I always worked 70, minimum 70. And they give me like 40 hours and like, and start picking up shifts. So I started doing 16 hour shifts, 12 hour shifts. And then I used to commute to, to the nursing uh, uh, job that I had. And I used to always listen to like audio CDs, that's before Audible. So I used to go to the library, get the audio CDs, and I one of the CDs I used to listen to, Tony Robbins and uh, Robert Kiyosaki, and I always talked about real estate here and there. So on my time off, I used to look at real estate. I used to look at real estate deals and things like that. And then uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad had seminar, a big seminar, and they, they sold us a very expensive package. And I, I didn't have the money at that time. I bought it with credit cards and everything. And it was total bullshit, to be honest. Um, but I got a little bit of taste of real estate, uh, of doing like investments and things like that. So I went to get my real estate license just so I can run comparables and things like that. But at that time, I did what they used to call wholesaler. So you're a wholesaler. We used to go to Detroit, my brother and I, and we used to put signs. We buy houses cash and have a burner for them that's connected to it. Um, and uh, then I got my real estate license, and then I went uh, I, to hang my license. I went and hung it with a brokerage called Keller Williams. And at that time, they were running a program called Bold, which is like, it's all about mindset, strategies, and sales. So I go to this Bold class, and it's my first day. I walk in there, and they're standing up. They're doing affirmation. They're talking about mindset. And I'm like, holy shit, there's people that speaks my language. So... I'm like, man, I really, I'm really digging this because I try to bring that to the nursing world and they're not ha having it. I'll walk into the nursing thing and I used to tell them, give me, and I don't want to give the name of the facility, but there's, there, there's a, one of the halls, it's called Hall High 100s, which we used to call it the pit because we used to have like psych patients go there. Yeah. And I go, nobody wants that. And I go there, I'm like, give me, put me in the pit. Because I just love the challenge of it. Like, put me in the pit. Let's go save some lives. And they say, man, shut the fuck up. <laughs> shut up with like this positivity, positivity bullshit. Go just do your job. And I couldn't bring that culture to the nursing world. Like, they didn't get it. Though we were supposed to be the one preaching it. So I saw that in real estate. And so I, I got into it and I started doing it part time. And I really wanted to get out of the nursing world. And started doing it more and more and more. Uh, and it got to a point, <clears throat> I actually hired a coach and the coach told me one day we're sitting in the, in the coaching, um, seminar and he's like, 
where do you want to be in your real estate business? At that time, I was a part time. I used to go. I used to go to to the office in the morning and wear my scrubs and go to the nursing job at night. And he said, "What's stopping you from getting to where you had to, to where you want to be?" And I told him, "Well, I, you know, I worked 50, 60 hours as, as a nurse." And he said, "When are you going to quit your nursing job?" And I'm like, "Fuck! I never thought about quitting my nursing job because I felt guilty. You know, I spent, I spent all this money, all this time. I failed nursing school. Like I wasn't the smartest kid, so I failed nursing school three times. I failed my NCLEX exam, which is the nursing exam, two times, and I passed on the third time. So I'm like, man, I spent, I spent all my life studying for this. I'm not just going to let it go." And he made me commit. And I committed, and then I just quit. Probably wasn't the smartest move, but it was one of the best moves ever. Uh, I quit, went full-time real estate, business took off, uh, and yes, didn't look back since. Now I just go on a volunteer trip. I still have my nursing license, but I go on a volunteer trip. I go volunteer and do what I like to do without you know, following the system, uh, and it's been a blessing. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So did you find it rewarding? Real estate? Yeah. Yeah. It's... Uh, it was rewarding in in sense of gave me freedom to do what I wanted to do. Yeah. So uh, not too excited about selling houses, but the process, you know, gives me freedom to do other things. Yeah. 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 Which you've been taking advantage of, obviously, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. So when you so with you know we met through we are the they you know yeah. our men's group right yeah how did you hear about we are the they. Uh, I met Jimmy at a, con a real estate convention in Texas, <clears throat> and I, you know, he spoke. I went, con I talked to him because he was a realtor. I'm a realtor, and connected with him. And then Jimmy did uh, real estate coaching at that time for a little bit. I was part of that group, and then he did a real estate investment group. I was part of that group, and then he opened up. We are the they group one. I'm like, okay, I don't understand what that is. So let let the first group <laughs> run through, yeah. uh, and then. And then when he opened up group two, at that time I was out of coaching. I didn't have the coaching. I didn't have the environment. So I had a conversation with him and he's one hell of a closer. Actually, he didn't need to close me. I just, I was like sold in. So, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, so I got in the group. So our first event down in Moab, yeah. what did you, what'd you think when you were down there when you saw all these guys? I was like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I was intimidated, honestly. Um, you know, I walk in there. Some of the guys knew each other, and they were like, yeah, at least they could relate on, on like, hey, where are you from? Moab and South Jordan. And, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, uh, Spanish. And, and, and then I'm like, you know, I felt like I was like an outsider from Michigan. And then we got some people that had done some crazy shit, like, crazy accomplishments in their lives, you know? Um, and so I just felt intimidated. So I was, uh, I was actually, and I shared it with you guys, I was like uh, creatively avoiding uh, being in a room. I'll go on my phone and trying to hide and I would have to pull myself out and just trying to get back in there. And then we start doing things that really got us out of our comfort zone, at least got me out of my comfort zone. Oh yeah. Uh, but by end of the event, I think it clicked for me. I'm like, okay, I, I, I understand what this is about. Yeah. Uh, this is more than I, I thought it's going to be like a business, you know, some business yeah. uh, events and networking. So I've been a lot of networking events, uh, but it was nothing like it. Yeah. No, it was cool, man. It was, it was a wild experience, dude. We're, I, I think we all kind of thought the same thing. This might be like those networking events, a little more business like, you know. Yeah. That we're down there telling everyone how awesome we are and then building ourselves up and then we're admitting to things by stepping into a circle and stepping back out of it. And Correct. We were humbled and built up at the same time, you know, and it was kind of fun. It was fun doing it with guys, you know, and now we have these like lifelong friends and, you know, yeah. connections and it's just like, it's the craziest thing in the world. Yeah. Who would have thunk? And, and, and it challenged, like it challenged me a lot because uh, like, like growing up, I had a belief of what a man is, right? And what's, what it takes to be a man. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things a man doesn't do is cry or share their weakness. Uh, and that quickly realized that's that you know that's not the case. Um, we we're doing a lot of crying, uh, a lot of uh, being vulnerable, th things like that. And maybe it took me, uh, I would say, maybe till the second event that I was able to get vulnerable with everybody. And it it took I had to go like to do deep work to kind of uninstall the program that I had that was installed. Uh, you know, during the culture, the time that I grew up in, and what it, and my thought of what a man is. Yeah. 
and then then we you know you get to the watt and then they, they quickly uh, like teach you what's you know at least what's what's the right way of doing it which I'm 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 glad you know it, it happened I, I I relate with it I align with it 100 percent and I'm I'm glad I had that you know opportunity to do so yeah yeah, yeah me too it's it's vulnerable such an interesting thing because there's to the way to the point that you're saying as a man you need to be strong Correct. right you need to be powerful yeah and but that doesn't mean that you're cold and dark yes you know the vulnerability side of you comes in where it's like you no know, you can be very honest and open but still very powerful at the same time yes and i like that i like that guidance yeah. you know and i think it re really resonates with men especially nowadays we're kind of under attack Yes. In our culture, right? Yeah. And it's like, no, you need strong men. Strong men built the world. Cool. Absolutely. Head to toe. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, we're the ones that get out and do the dirty jobs. We don't complain. We're the ones that stand up front. You know, we're the ones that fight wars, you know? Yeah. And that takes nothing away from women. Right. It's just what men are. Yeah, correct. You know? I agree. And we don't need to change that nature. No. You know, we actually need to embrace it and, and push it. Yeah. And help society move along with strong men and strong women. Like yeah. true equality, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree 100%. Yeah. yeah. So, Fadi, what are you looking forward to most in your life? Uh, what I look forward to most in my life, I really like the adventure trips. <laughs> uh, for me, uh, right now, it's experiences and relationships. Uh, I want to cultivate more uh, experiences and relationships. And I think that's why I'm glad I went through nursing and i got i worked with a lot of hospice patients and i got to experience what it looks like to be on the other end mm. so all my hospice patient and patients that i was with them their deathbed uh the ones that had some consciousness and some even out of consciousness the things they would remember the most is the experiences they had i had a judge that told me she just climbed the mountain and she told me all her stories and then I thought she, because she had a lot of um, dementia, so I thought she was just like making things up. And then when her kids came out, I told them like, "Oh my gosh, she told you that she actually has done that." I'm like, "Shit!" Even with dementia, she, she still remember those experiences. Yeah. Um, and relationships. Some I saw some people that died alone, and I saw some people that had hundred people at their bedside, uh, and told really good stories and experiences and things like that so that kind of ingrained in my brain that i, I do want to cultivate I, I gotta sometimes remind myself to pull myself out of what we call the grind and then cultivate more relationship more experiences yeah 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 i'm with you dude i'm it's kind of the same thing with me i just i'm, I'm excited for all the experiences that i'm going to plan and do and have and the people we get to hang out with and enjoy and i mean it's even that that first adventure trip right to iceland that was crazy <laughs> yeah and that place is like nowhere else on earth, yes. you know? Imagine. Hell, half the time I felt like I was on the freaking moon. Yeah. You know, yeah. just walking <laughs> yeah, through yeah, yeah. gray volcanic rock for yeah. miles and miles and miles, you know? It's like, how oh, cool. Which, you know, Interstellar was shot there. All these movies were shot there. And it's yeah. like, yeah, I get it. You know, it's kind of crazy, right? And then we're with all of us, right? Yeah. You know, all was smiling, looking around. It's like, <laughs> holy shit, we're here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> wow, what it's like trip. such, it's like hard to explain like how how special that is. Yeah. You know, yeah, it is. I actually, when I left, so I, I brought my wife to Iceland, you know, if you remember at the yeah. end, right. When yeah. everyone kind of went home. So we spent another five or six days there. And, um, when I left, I was like, okay, this will be the last time I come here. You know, like I saw with my wife, I saw with my boys. I didn't, I didn't obviously didn't see all of it. You know, there's plenty of things more to see, but I saw, I got the experience. Right. Yeah. And it was about a month ago. I just looked at my wife one day and I'm like, I want to take the kids to Iceland. Wow. And she was like, really? And I was like, yeah, I want to go in the summer though. You know, so it's not as cold, yeah, right? Yeah. Which is fine. You're not going to see the northern lights, but you know, like it's yeah. just a different trip, right? And she's like, "All right, let's do it." Yeah. You know, so we're going to try and plan. We're going to wait till Watts when we're done. You know, so it'll be another like year and a half before we actually go. But I don't know. I just kind of thought, you know, I want to take. I had such a good experience. There. I want to take the people I love there. That's what it is. Yeah. You know, you had a good experience and now you want to share that experience yeah. with someone else. Yeah. And I almost want to like send it in the group text, be like, "Hey guys, you know, January 2025." I'm going to Iceland. Bring your families. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Maybe five of us will come with families. Who knows? Yeah, I'm Just sure caravan through something. that whole freaking place. Yeah. yeah. That'd be awesome. For sure. So my friend, we're at the end of the podcast. Oh, no. Went fast, huh? Yeah, sure did. I need to know your best two minutes of advice. 
Uh, damn. My best two minutes of advice. Um, my best advice right now is something that I am going through right now is try to understand why you do the things you do and try to understand how much of your belief is your belief, not somebody else that was installed the beliefs in you, how much of your program is actually your programming um, and, and try to know yourself like to your core. Uh, and that's something that's been work in progress for me that I'm, I'm working on finding out like who am I really not like, why am I making the decisions I'm making? What I want to be, like, for me, not because of anything else. Like, who am I to the core? Uh, and, and as soon as I've been taking that path, making decision, the decision process has been very, very easy for me. I Like, I can make decisions quick. I don't need to think about it. You can't uh, peer pressure me to do things I don't want to do that, I, you know, like, I, I know I know what I stand for, and then... I know where I'm going and what what's in alignment with me, what's not. So I think life just become easier and simpler. Yeah, not perfect. Yeah. Well, my friend, thanks for coming on the podcast, dude. This has been fun. Damn, man. Thanks for having yeah. me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the President McCormack Podcast, brought to you by McCormack Foundation, Saxton Fund, ADP Lemco, and Professional Floor Systems. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and keep up with Mark on Instagram at President McCormack. 